God bless notation. God bless formalisms. <laughs> Welcome to part two of a walkthrough for aligning interpretable causal variables with distributed neural representations. Did I remember the title right? Dude, you got it. Fuck word yes. for words. 10 out of 10. We just spent an hour analyzing the title, so I'd better have it down. Uh -huh. And I'm joined by Atticus Geiger, a PhD student at Stanford who wrote this fantastic paper. Want to scroll up to the top so people can appreciate your co-authors? And my wonderful co-authors. Yes. Thank you, co-authors. We just spent a while understanding what the title means. Do you want to understand what the rest of the paper means? Yeah. Now we're going to go jump into the methods section. So. Beautiful. Anything worth understanding about the abstract or intro or just like kind of boring fluff you write for reviewers? I would not say boring fluff you, we write for reviewers at all. I would say, you know, amazing programmatic deep statements about how we view things. Some of your reviewers might be watching this video. Yeah, and uh, we say lots of loads of important things, unironically, in my opinion. You know, these are, <laughs> I, I, uh, they're great. They're great summaries. But I also think a lot of what we talked about in the first hour was just uh, this sort of like philosophical high level. And I feel like we're sort of on the same page. I vibe, but I, yeah. Ooh, I do notice a line in the abstract about why existing methods are bad. Do you oh, want to yeah, just yeah. briefly <laughs> explain why everyone else's work is boring in order to emphasize how awesome you are? Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly just piss off how everyone make, else. Make in friends in the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, essentially, I guess it's just really important to figure out exactly what you're doing and that there's going to be really crucial differences between doing things that are sort of based in like statistical measurements of models or correlations. And like, you can understand that with probability and information theory, you know, you can definitely make statements in there that are like well supported and true. And yeah, sort of talk about how easily accessible some of this correlational information is. But I think fundamentally, when we think about interpretability and is especially Especially when we think about mechanistic interpretability, we're thinking about a causal explanation. Causal in like the good old science sense, like the same way we want a causal explanation of like billiard balls and we want a causal explanation of pendulums. We want to understand how the system evolves in time, what are the algorithms and processes it's carrying out, what are the relevant sort of conceptual quantities that are being represented inside the system. And uh, if that is indeed what you care about, then yeah, it's important that you sort of like, yeah, we're, we're clear that we're grounding ourselves in the right sort of framework to answer those questions in a faithful and robust way. So uh, yeah, that's sure. my, that's my soapbox for, for 15 seconds. Yeah, right sure. there. All right. All right. So taking the soapbox back, cause it's my YouTube channel. So they're like high level family of work. All of this sits in is trying to find causal abstractions to understand a model where mm -hmm. A causal abstraction is a formalism for this like interpretable, meaningful algorithm. And you're like, A, bold assumption of everything in mechanistic interpretability. Models actually learn these algorithms. It's meaningful. Everything's great. We just suck at interpreting them and need to get better at this, but it's our fault, not theirs. And this particular approach is kind of somewhat different from the Chris Ola image circuitsy approach where they go and stare at individual neurons and understand what these mean, and closer to the like current family of language model-focused work, where we do a bunch of causal interventions on the model in order to really understand the algorithm they've learned, and we do less of the like staring at weights. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right, and I think that in the end, I feel like the most beautiful holistic picture of transformers will be both making meaningful statements about interpretable dimensions of the residual stream and also having statements about how the heads move around this information. And that both of those kind of things together form a very robust picture of like how information is moving through the network. So gotcha. it's not a competition. We want as many tools as possible. Mm -hmm. And yep. yes. And I think. Yeah, and, and it also went thinking of causal abstraction as a theoretical framework. It's really like not even like you need to write your papers using causal abstraction and, and necessarily in that like mediation analysis or patching might be the right way for sort of determining whatever problem you're going with. But in general, a sort of litmus test for is this a mechanistic interpretability tool is sort of can I encode it in the form of making some statement about the semantic or meaningful content of neural representations in a, in an intuitive algorithm, like a high-level algorithm that a human could understand? Checks out. 
And Atticus has a paper he's extremely proud of where he takes like all interpretability techniques and checks whether they can fit into this framework and then makes fun of the ones that don't fit into the framework for not being real interpretability. That's exactly what the paper is. Yes. All right. And final bit of context setting, the field of mechanistic interpretability has had its own flowering of causal methods, things like causal tracing in causal mediation analysis and the Rome paper, activation patching and path patching and interpretability in the wild, which I have a walkthrough about and some other stuff. Causal scrubbing. Yeah, causal scrubbing. This like great work from Redwood that kind of like distills a lot of the stuff and also drew some on Atticus's work. Atticus has been in his own corner of academia, doing things like actually going to conferences and boring stuff like that, but kind of like converging a lot of the same ideas of like, this is just the right way to understand a model god that. Ah, uh, yes. I like that ending point. Really vibe cool. with it. Yeah, All right. yeah. So in contrast to existing methods, firstly, you're just like, I am doing causal stuff. But also a bunch of other, other papers have done like causal stuff. So that's kind of a, not original and reviewer two will make fun of you if you do that. So the like additional, yes, you got abstractions and you're also like, man, all previous work, they just like assumed heads were meaningful or assumed MLP layers were meaningful. Screw that. I'm going to find the right things. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I feel like I slipped uh, into explaining the title again, but whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, we're good. We're good. All right. So let's start just staring at this real quick. Okay. So look at these weights. Now imagine instead of W, this weight matrix being this rotation by 20 degrees, imagine if it's just the identity matrix. And I will note for people who are similarly annoyed by Atticus's lack of pretty pictures, that you could draw this as a rotation by 20 degrees, even if yes. it looks like numbers and is cold and sad and depressing. A hundred percent. Yes, I agree. I like numbers too much and I like math too much. <laughs> I, I think you're it's a, a linguist, man. It's a reasonable criticism. I'm a linguist, but I think like more like a mathematician, just like Amy Adams in Arrival. I mean, I am a pure mathematician. I found a way to do biology to math, so you know. Uh huh. All right. So yeah, imagine this is an identity matrix. It should be pretty clear just staring at it why the neural network is implementing this very simple algorithm of just copying the inputs and then computing the conjunction. Right, so right. it's just I'm I'm gonna walk through that. Yeah, yeah, we should. Yeah, exactly. So if we represent x1 and x2 as like zero or one, the identity transformation would just make h1 and h2 identical to x1 and x2. And then y is just going to be the sum of h1 and h2. So it's just the sum of x1 and x2. And so if it if they're both and then it'll push the bias over the threshold and we'll predict true. And in any other case, we'll predict false. All right. It is not obvious to me why those are the same diagram. So I'm going to I'm going to try walking through this and uh -huh. you're going to correct me every time I screw up. So uh -huh. we're pretending that this is the identity, which means W1 is the first row of the identity, 1 0. Mm -hmm. And so H1 is like x1 x2 dot predicted with 1 0, which is just x1. So H1 mm -hmm. is x1. This mm -hmm. is clearly the same as the other as the other diagram. Mm -hmm. W2 is 0, 1, so we extract x2, so the x2 and the h2 node are the same as the other diagram, and in particular, the like cross-connecting edges between x2 and h1, and x1 and h2 don't matter. Yep. And w is 1, 1, which means you're just adding things together, and you're taking x1 plus x2 plus b, which is like minus 1.8, yep. and... Why is that equivalent to V3 equals V1 and V2? Oh, uh, because we're assuming that we're applying a softmax, sorry, to the to this log. It. Like the way we interpret the final explanation of the network is that above zero is true and below zero is false. Okay. I'm just gonna be like, sure, that is that is a reasonable statement. I, yeah, I believe I mean, that's this how is you would train, description. That's how you would train a logistic classifier i don't know right like uh yeah. sure why not mm -hmm. and so uh yeah those are just like the same network as, or, or like a same circuit except for the output you have to interpret it as where you collapse the space into above zero equivalence class and below zero equivalence class are the two outputs yes 
And wait, just to clarify a few more things. Uh-huh. X1 uh-huh. and X2 are binary. They're like either yes, zero binary. or binary. It's either true or okay. false. There's just four inputs to this domain. They're true Very or false. Task. Yep. But you're doing linear algebra to it because you're like what? some weird, twisted mathematician. Exactly. <laughs> because it's and a toy problem to explain. Then yeah. you're like, I don't know, kind of sticking Y into just like, is it bigger than zero or not? And... Mm-hmm. So, like, Y is this weird function of H1 and H2. Uh, V3 is, like, a very sensible function of V1 and V2. And you've, you're basically just being like, okay, there's four cases. If we can show in each of the cases that the weird function Y is the same as the sensible function V3, these align. But we need to do the case analysis. Mm-hmm. And we need to do the case analysis? So that's what, that's just to check they have the same behavior, right? the input output behavior of the network and that is correct and so another thing that we won't get into immediately this moment is just also these intermediate variables are identical in that case to the other intermediate variables it should be kind of intuitively obvious because they are just uh literally copying it it's just like a a linear algebra version of writing down this boolean program so it's not nearly as exciting but so why this is now going to be the motivation for looking at like a non-standard basis is when you rotate this hidden representation by 20 degrees, the behavior, the input output behavior is still correct on four inputs. So it just happens to tweak it just enough. So it only goes above 1.8 when both of them are true and otherwise it does not. And that's still the case, but it's actually going to be the case that this internal structure alignment between the neurons and the high-level variables is broken Mm -hmm. by this slight rotation. So it's an interesting case of just this very small tweak to the weights. It's going to preserve the input-output behavior, but it's going to produce a failure case, namely this failure case. All right, all right, all right. Let's walk through that. So Mm -hmm. going way too fast for me, and thus presumably far, far too fast for the deals. So Uh go back to the previous diagram. Also, side note, I noticed these do not have figure captions. What's up with that? This is later. Uh, these are just, I guess, these are just like inline figures that are like kind of like just walking you through in the text. The big ones have big figure captions. Were these all just like written in ticks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild. Thank you. Do you use GPT-4 for this, or is this just like no. pure homegrown skill? Sweat. Like drawing weird blood, diagrams. Tears. I you love know. it. All right, Great. all right. So we have this function. It's like a bunch of linear algebra for like some matrix W. And you're just asserting to me that it is a true maths fact that whether this matrix is the identity or rotate by 20, it's still Mm -hmm. going to be a Boolean and. If you just look at the four possible inputs, it still just completely works out. Yep, that's true. This yep, is like that's right. not obvious to me on inspection, but like what if I'll it take shouldn't it be obvious. I mean, it's just kind of like if you rotate it a little bit, it doesn't chip oh. it and break anything. Ah, okay. You're not saying it's the same. Why is the same function? You're saying because x one and x two are true or false, and there's like four cases. It like just so happens that twisting it a little bit doesn't really matter. Exactly. Because you've got enough leeway. Exactly. Yeah. Different uh, different model than the identity model. Completely different model. You know, now it has all the causal yeah. connections between all four. But it just so happens that this model change in the sort of continuous space didn't result in a behavioral change as far as the four inputs and what is the predicted output. I vibe. Could you not just have like a simple motivating example? This is the simple motivating sure. example, dude. It gets so much more complicated than this. Oh my gosh. But uh, here's I'll, the here's I'll try the reason to take it's the broken. viewers through it with me. All right. So here's the reason this is a bad uh, that this alignment, like these two neurons don't separately encode true and false anymore. So consider these two inputs. So false true and true true. At the high level, you can run through true true. You get all trues all the way through. Yep. Yep. You can set V1 for this false true input to be true, Mm -hmm. and then that would make the output true. So this is an interchange intervention. You take the value of a variable, and you set it to be the value it would take for a different input. All right. And for viewers at home who uh, do Macintop, rather than weird academic jargon, uh, interchange Mm -hmm. intervention is the same thing as activation patching which is the same thing as resample ablation and causal tracing and like 
a bunch of other mm-hmm. names for the same basic thing of yep. take an activation, set it to another value, and in particular, set it to a value that that chunk of the model can take on a different input. That's exactly correct. Like, you want to understand how a model knows the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, but also knows the Colosseum is in Rome. You mm-hmm. take some attention ahead on the Eiffel Tower input and intervene on the Colosseum input to patch in its output from the Eiffel Tower, and you see if the model changes its mind from Rome to Paris. If it does, the head was important. Yep. And that's exactly right. This is like actually one of the like real core insights of mechanistic interpretability. We or oh, mm, spit strong. This is like one of the core things that makes a bunch of the techniques we do work because it allows you to have really surgical interventions. You're not even being like, what is everything this head does? Which you would if you did a more standard thing like ablacing it, just deleting the head. Mm-hmm. You're saying, mm-hmm. what is this head doing if we control for things like we're doing factual recall, we're looking at European landmarks, we want to get a city. If you control for all of that, how does this head's functioning respond to the fact that it's the Eiffel Tower rather than Paris? Being surgical like this is just one of the key things that makes being mechanistic rather than incredibly surface level and janky possible. And you need this amount of precision if you want to say anything remotely coherent. So box over, back to you, Atticus. Yep, I just think that's completely in line with everything I believe, and especially with the role of causality and the intervention being in mechanistic interpretability in a very deep foundational way, as far as like, in my mind, these are some of the, like, that's a, these are the perspectives that sort of unify all these sort of works that are aiming at characterizing information flow inside networks. Yeah. Yeah. And so here we can see a failure case of like our analysis. Oh, no. Oh, no. Which is, you know, good for our toy example, which is saying like, so if this were, so consider the input 0111 here. If this were the identity matrix case, the middle parts would just be 01 and 11. And then this intervention would result in the network outputting true. But because we have this weird rotation, it actually happens to be the case that even though th- that our hypothesis that H1 encodes truth of V1 is not true, because when we plug in 0, 1, you can replace H1 with the value it takes on for the input 1, 1, but the network still outputs false. Okay, okay. So zooming out a bit, we already know that our causal model that made sense for the NNC is now broken on the like rotated matrix task because it is just the case that h1 and h2 use both inputs and are no mm-hmm. longer just binary zeros and ones and this yep. is clearly a thing and so we just already observed it's broken but you're saying as the perspective of like a model prober we're not necessarily making a like algorithmic level thing about this is exactly what this variable represents our main tool is causal interventions. So in addition to just being like, does H1 change when you resample one of the inputs, which I guess is also a bad thing you might do, Mm -hmm. and which would illustrate the difference between the models, you can also take the counterfactual of just like, how is V3 constructed from V1 and V2? If we just have no idea what's going on inside the model, and we're trying to do these counterfactuals, and we're only intervening on V1 and V2 for different possible inputs, it would be the case that the intervention outcomes would no longer be the same. And you just happen to have like a particular concrete example where in your idealized causal model, this intervention changes the output V3 from false to true, but mm-hmm. in the like weird messed up case, it fails. And yeah. this is all just a worked example to illustrate that your causal model has broken because of course it's broken, you've just changed the weighting. Yeah, so now this alignment, we've sort of disproven this alignment, right? We have a counter yes. example that's saying, yep, like this, uh, this alignment between intermediate variables here, it, it actually doesn't make sense specifically because we can find some counterfactuals where the high and low level are outputting different things. And that in that way, you're saying, you're kind of saying, hey, you told me this was a truth vector and I could take, or a truth representation, and I could take any false representation and replace it with a true representation and get some expected outcome. And this is a failure of that. 
Right. Like you can kind of think of a causal abstraction as like rules of engagement for what you are allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Where if V3 represents like input one and input two, then V3 should be exactly the same. Whether input one is false and input two is false, or input one is true, but input two is still false. And so you should be able to interchange between them without changing anything about the model. Ultimately, this is going to be an approximation, probably because models are cursed as fuck, but it's exactly. like a thing you should be allowed to do, and if doing it breaks everything, your causal model is bad, and you should feel bad. That's exactly right, yeah, if you, and you should feel personally bad. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. Okay, cool. That is, that is the healthy orientation to research, just like feel uh -huh. deep emotional anguish every time your experiments fail. But... You might actually get to feel good if you rotate your bases. What? Oh my god, what? Yeah. Is, so this, is this figure also in ticks? Of course, everything is in ticks. So now we get to this point where we're saying, we, we, we know what this matrix is doing. You know, it's still representing this information in orthogonal space. It's just slightly rotated space. And so... Now, what we're going to do is instead of doing an interchange intervention, we'll do what we call distributed interchange intervention, but really it's just apply some invertible function, in this case, a rotation change of basis to a group of variables, in this case, a, a vector, and then get a new space of variables, then do an interchange intervention, and then apply the inverse of the function, in this case, unrotate. And so you're doing interchange intervention in the rotated space. And so in this example, in the rotated space, yay, we recovered the exact identity of the vectors. We do the interchange intervention, and then the outcome is now true instead of false. And so if we align the high-level variables with these rotated dimensions, then we fix the problem. And so this is sort of a toy example that is showing you a case where limiting yourself to individual you like standard basis dimensions is going to fail okay so i guess trying to work through this mm -hmm. this is kind of a mess up example because it was initially about this nice discrete logic where you had like ands and ors and binary mm -hmm. inputs but because we're talking about finding meaningful directions you kind of need it to be about directions in space and you need it to be about linear algebra, which is why you've moved us to this weird ass world where we where we're doing linear algebra to these binary inputs. And you now want us to think about H1 and H2 less as like individual nodes representing the two inputs, but more as like the two elements of a vector. And to think about the model as mapping the two inputs like X and Y, X1 and X2, as this vector that then gets mapped to the scalar y. And you're saying, okay, we have h1 and h2, but I don't really want to do interventions on h1 and h2. Mm -hmm. Seems like the wrong, the wrong basis. How can I rotate h1 and h2 to something more meaningful? And you're saying that by the glorious power of algebra, you notice that because the thing you changed is you rotated by 20, you can now rotate back by 20, like by minus 20, mm -hmm. and you reverse this. And then I kind of lose track of what on earth the diagram is telling me. Yeah, so this is saying, so this is just walking you through doing the interchange intervention. So if you put in the input 0, 1, you get yep. this la hidden layer. Then you rotate the hidden layer mm -hmm. to get 1, 0 in the rotated space. Why is and it 1, 0? Should it oh, be zero one? Shit, yeah, that's the typo. That should be zero one. <laughs> hey, that's sweet. This is what you get from using go. ticks. This is awesome. Okay. Should cool. I got TP3? Yeah. Should I got TP4? It should, it, yeah, it should be zero one. Uh, can't come, come on, man. Great. Okay. That, that, that was will really never replace me. They were <laughs> no, it, it will never replace me. I'm an, an artisanal LaTeX user. Okay. I will be. Side of a man with long AGI timelines. <laughs> yeah all right so yes this should be zero one and um then this yeah if the, this is zero and this is one then everything is fixed in this diagram because the input should be zero one 
And then once we rotate the hidden layer, we get just the input. And then we do the same thing for this other run of the network. And then in the rotated space, we intervene and set the first dimension to be what it would be if the input were one one. And then we unrotate back to the normal basis in the hidden layer of the network, run the network the rest of the way forward, and we get true. Checks out. And if you want to say a tick, this is the based, this is the true, <laughs> the true cream of the crop ticks right here. As okay. you can see. What am I looking at? Are beautiful, right? So this is a multi-source distributed interchange intervention. The second, the middle part, the red run, is the actual input you're providing. And the blue and green are two separate inputs for resampling ablation. And we say, take this three unit vector and rotate it to some non-standard basis. And you can see these vectors, these little drawings mm -hmm. are the same direction, but just in rotated yep. space. Yep. That was very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> do and then do that? This is some mad tick skills. This is, I literally make rotation matrices in ticks and then like apply them to the unit system. And then, yeah, it's hilarious. So but then, what you're saying is, despite being a linguist and most professional word cell, you're actually a shape rotator? I'm a shape rotator. Yeah, I love. I love it. Ticks. Anyway, so rotated space, three dimensions in this rotated space. And then you take the units, the first unit, and the second unit are intervened on and set to be the values they would be in these other runs. Mm -hmm. So we get this brown vector whose orthogonal components consist of the green, red, and blue vectors. And then we rotate that back into the normal space. And then we run the network the rest of the way through. So let me try to get my head around this again. So mm -hmm. the diagram you've got repeated three times at the top is a neural network. Each blob is a neuron. The dense lines are like they're applying each layer. And this is like a two hin layer MLP. Sure. And doing something with like four dimensional vectors. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're saying ah, people often draw neural networks where each neuron is like this ontologically separate thing that is like incredibly separate and pure and beautiful and nothing would mm -hmm. ever change. Now, you're saying, ah, screw this, we're doing linear algebra. These are not individual blobs, these are vectors. Mm -hmm. But then you're also looking at three rather than four of the neurons for some reason. And you're saying, okay, fourth neuron, you're a special snowflake, you're great, leave each side. <laughs> First three neurons, you are a vector. You do not have three meaningful blobs. You're instead of three-dimensional space. And actually, mm -hmm. you are the wrong blobs. There is a it's meaningful really. set of blobs, but it's different. And Y, 1, 2, and 3 is the thing you get when you rotate. And you're saying X1, X2, and X3 are all kind of linear combinations of Y1, Y2, and Y3, which means you can't do interchange interventions on any of them because then you'll be changing a little bit of all of the three variables. Exactly. And this is kind of a mess. Yep. Like how, I don't know, you're representing like shapes as red, green, or blue, triangle, square, or circle. And you want to, I don't know, patch in the green of a green triangle into a red square. But the only things you have are a red plus square direction and a red minus square direction. And exactly. It's like, you make red plus square into green plus triangle and red minus square. What? What is the model supposed to do? The system doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But if you rotate, so you've got like a red direction and a square direction. Now you can patch in red and everything's good and make that green. Yep. Can I just 100%. say, I prefer, I prefer my example to your example, just saying. I have a I have a paper with some shapes and colors, if that's your that's what floats your boat. I love rotating shapes. Shapes are great. <laughs> um, so here we're like, we've rotated into the meaningful thing. Now we can have the green inputs and the blue inputs and do interchange from each of those. And if we made it so the green and red agree on Y1 and the um, blue and red agree on Y2, this interchange should change nothing and everything should be fabulous. Yep. Cool. 
And we're not intervening on the fourth neuron because that's meaningful <laughs> and special. And we're not intervening on Y3 because, I don't know, seems fine. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, essentially, the, you're, you're totally right that the fourth neuron is randomly special and the third neuron is also randomly special. Like, it's just articulating. These are some possible things you could choose to. You could change the width of how you locate something. And uh, yeah, it is kind of interesting how you can sort of just choose any neurons existing in the layer to be a, a, a new unit of analysis is them as a group. Um, something maybe I think kind of crucial is saying, we're both saying that if you know red and blue have the same Y2 value, the swap shouldn't change anything. But also if blue has a different value for Y2, like we want there to be some different high level input. So this is sort of a crucial difference between uh, resampling ablation or just sort of making changes that shouldn't matter in the network, that when we have like a high level model we're aligned with, we don't just say what changes matter or don't matter. We say, given a change at the high level, what should the systematic change in the output be? So you could replace vectors with different values or sorry, variables with different values. Gotcha. So returning to my shape and color example, uh -huh. We can say, okay, let's say our model is extracting the color of the shape. Mm -hmm. um, then if we patch green triangle into red square, um, if we patch the shape, this should not matter. This is like a resample ablation. We patch in triangle rather than square, and the model is fine. While the model might be, if we patch in zero, like we ablate the square, maybe everything breaks, it's kind of a mess, boring. That's a resample ablation. This does not matter. But then there's like the more interesting thing of a interchange intervention or activation patch that shows something does matter, where if we patch in the green from green triangle, the model should now say green. Mm -hmm. And we know that if we patch in everything from green triangle, the model will then say green. It's boring. And the exciting thing is being really surgical. We just copy in the green direction from green triangle into red square. And this is fancy and impressive, and patching in like a single direction is like about as impressive as it's possible to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess really this gets to just the final part, other than all the the complicated math statements of what these things are. You is... do way too much maths, man. I say Thank this you, as man. Uh, international maths Olympiad contestants. Too much fucking maths. Uh, too much fucking math. I love it though. God, God bless notation. God bless formalisms. <laughs> God bless math mode. Yeah, so I guess really like the final final step here is just in this generic case where you have this rotation matrix is just making this a learned parameter. And so essentially when you do an interchange intervention at the high level and the low level, you can then, and it, it, you can just do this with a random rotation matrix. So just randomly seed in your rotation matrix to a, uh, rotate things, and then just update the rotation matrix with interchange intervention examples coming into the high-level model and low-level model. And you just use backpropagation to update the way you rotate the vector representation to be uh, yeah, such that the interventions are producing the same output at both levels. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Slow down. So, uh -huh. you, so we have this idea of interventions in the right units of analysis. You've given us examples where we don't know the units of analysis, or we know the units of analysis, but they are not kind of the base elements. And so we rotate, but we know the rotation to find the units of analysis. And you're now saying, screw that, not ambitious enough. What do we do if we don't know the right units of analysis? Which obviously is like one of the genuinely hard bits about a model. And you're saying, duh, we're doing machine learning. We never know what we're doing. We just define parameters and apply gradient descent and we figure it out. Yep. What can we do? Let's apply gradient descent and figure it out. And you just parameterize a rotation matrix and say, YOLO, let's see what happens. And when YOLO see what happens is, is in the form of doing aligned interchange interventions at the low and high level. And so then, you know, according to whatever alignment you have between high-level variables and low-level variables, you do the swap at the high level, then you go on to the low level, you swap the same the neurons or the neural representations 
corresponding and to, to those high-level variables. High-level mm -hmm. means simple causal abstraction. That's what I mean, yeah. Um, Interpretable, simple. Low-level yeah. means the actual pile of inscrutable linear algebra we're pretending is interpretable. Yep, yep, exactly. But really 100%. it's just a scam to get us grant money. Exactly, yeah, and checks not out, a very out. good one. If we wanted to scam, we should say that it'll make the models better. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of useless. It just like makes them safer. So yeah, it's more ethical and, this is like, and, and better. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. Is is alignment useful? Who knows? I should probably say for the record, alignment is great, and I do not consider myself to be scamming people. Oh, me too. Me too. I mean, if I'm scamming people, I'm doing a really bad job because I'm just getting. <laughs> Uh, PhD stipend. <laughs> I think I could be making more bank if I were being malicious. Yeah, I, I guess now I, I would say we can just kind of get to maybe the initial experimental result, which is just to say, where's the best thing? All right, here's the high level ooh, model. Ooh, ooh, one question. Uh -huh. So the thing which confuses me still mm -hmm. is you said you learned the right directions in the high level model and the right directions of the low level model and i'm like surely you know the directions of the high level model, right Wait, we don't we don't learn the i'm if i said that totally misspoke high level model right. fixed object okay okay and when you say we're learning a rotation do you mean we have like a thousand neurons and we learn a thousand by thousand rotation matrix or do you yes. mean okay i was gonna ask do you mean the obviously sensible thing if you learn like five orthogonal directions and assume everything else doesn't matter. I mean, you, yeah, that that's like a way to scale it. But yeah, I mean, in the case of this these experiments where we are working with small networks, whole thing, no reason not to. Wild. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in the case of like the residual stream, we, we break it up by like tokens and stuff. But uh, is this not yeah. like massively overkill? Uh, yeah, it totally, totally could be. And I mean, I guess it really depends on how much you end up looking for and stuff. I think at first it is massively overkill, but I think in the case of superposition, it's actually unironically underkill. Like in the case of superposition, you probably want to learn like an N by M matrix and then support interchange interventions only on sparse inputs mm. or, or like only sampling your inputs sparsely or something like that. But that's something maybe we can talk yeah. about later because I feel like that's a meaty... Uh, yep, yep, sounds good. Maybe the final point to mention is probably approximate causal abstraction and thinking about these in a like just messier setting. What's an approximate causal abstraction? Yeah, so in the case of all of our interchange interventions working out perfectly, meaning they have the same effect at the high and low level, then we have a abstraction relationship that stands in full force and we're licensed to entirely reason about this simple causal model instead of the messy underlying black box network. But obviously in practice, this is not going to be cleanly the case. And so we want some basic metrics for just starting to count how, to what degree is this simple model a faithful abstraction of the complicated black box? You're saying? Gotcha. Because models are cursed and I don't know, even in the like grokking case, I have another walkthrough on where I understood modular addition. It was still kind of a little bit of a mess. You could kind of say this bit of the model referred to this and this bit referred to this, but there was still like a bit of noise. Mm -hmm. Here, mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, okay. We are causal model gives us this like long list of interchange interventions we're allowed to make that should not break the model. Mm -hmm. They mostly don't break the model, break it a teensy bit. What does partial credit look like? And you're trying yeah. to find a metric for like how good or bad this is. And this is particularly interesting because like a pretty great recent McIntyre work was the causal scrubbing work by Redwoods, which is their take on the right metric here. Yeah, so I, their take on the right metric here, I don't want to try to articulate it in full detail, just in case I do it incorrectly for the causal <laughs> scrubbing thing. Uh, so they seem to me to be kind of roughly aligned. And most of the what matters in their metric, which I'm, I'm pretty open to being sort of like good things to care about, is how do we do the sampling of our interchange interventions? Because if you just sort of look at the metric in general, I think 
we, you know, we're stating out theoretically just like this sum over a massive space. And so this is like the quantity we care about. But then in practice, there's a question of how to sample and explore this massive space of possible sort of like interchange interventions with all these different ways of sourcing our neural representations. Yeah, I mean, so for for us, when we were the most basic metric you have is like interchange intervention accuracy, which is just like how many of these swaps uh, in total work when you're just sampling them in the whole space. And then you can also look at how many of the impactful swaps were uh, were successful. So swaps where the output actually was supposed to change to something else, because those may be sort of like easier, more meaningful swaps and uh not not easier. They might be more difficult, meaningful swaps. And also in the original couple papers I had, I was trying to find subsets of the training space on which the whole the abstraction relationship held in full force. So your partial results, if you have like 90% interchange intervention accuracy, that actually could be like 10% of your data is just kind of like messy, bad, special case, whatever. And then 90% of your training data, you're actually getting a very clean computation circuit abstraction thing going on. And so, yeah, I think aggressively articulating the space of sort of like partial successes here and getting better at understanding what they're telling us and also grounding our explanations and interpretations in downstream uses, like the desire to manipulate or control a system, I think would be very helpful for actually making these more than kind of just numbers that exist in the ether. Gotcha. All right. And I spent that time half listening to you and half trying to pass this god-awful equation. My current <laughs> vibe is that you're just like, okay, what is the... I have these interventions I think I'm allowed to make. I have on the right a statement about the like high-level causal model that's neat and mathsy, and on the left a statement about the actual neural network and alignment between the two. Mm -hmm. The thing inside the brackets is somehow like the harm done over all possible interventions or something. So the thing in the brackets, this is distributed interchange intervention. This is interchange intervention. And it's saying distributed interchange intervention on model mapped to the high level is equal to the interchange intervention at the high level on the uh, same input. So it's like, Interchange intervention on the right is intervening in the high-level causal model. When we know what everything means, there's no need to be distributed. It's all fabulous. Yes, exactly. Well, DII is distributed interchange intervention. It's kind of chill. It's kind of fine. But this <laughs> is a statement about the actual neural network. Yes. So even without the D, it is a fundamentally different thing. And then the yes. D is saying... We don't even have a right basis, man. It's kind of a mess. Exactly. And that's where the R theta comes in, which is the parameterized uh, rotation matrix. So I guess we could look at the simplest, the, the result, because it's, I don't know, pretty toy, like very minor extension on even just like the Boolean thing in some ways. Yeah. Just a quick question about your metric. One of the interesting things about causal scrubbing to me is mm -hmm. they were like, okay, you have like this hierarchy of like, many layers of your model. Mm -hmm. We believe we're allowed to do some kind of interventions on layer one, such that layer two means the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this means that when we intervene, rather than replacing layer two with just layer two on some other input, we could replace it with layer two on some other input, but that in other input also had interventions in layer one. Like you can mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. weird mm -hmm. ass recursive interventions with a bunch of like tooling and algorithms that makes this like not a fucking mess well mm -hmm. only a bit of a fucking mess yeah 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 is that at all captured here or you're purely like one hop interventions that's a good question so i uh, definitely not in this paper i'm trying to think in the bigger like write-up i have whether this is I actually genuinely don't, not sure, because I know I've thought of this idea and I've definitely written it somewhere, but I'm not sure if I like articulate it because yeah, that is like a, yeah, I think it's something that should be supported. I mean, I think it's a very, very cool thing to do and definitely sort of increases the space of, hmm. I guess I agree with the heart of it because you're saying in this weird counterfactual situation, I created a vector. I think it represents true. 
I really think when we say this vector represents true, the way that statement is cashed out in like a meaningful way is that anywhere we have this variable realized, if it's false, I can replace it with this true vector and the expected thing should happen. If it's true, I should replace it with a true vector and nothing else should happen downstream. And so if that's not the case, it's sort of like, yeah, it does feel like you're only being partially successful at being a true vector. And I guess it's just where like the rubber hits the road for intuitions on me on like what it means to represent something. But uh, yeah, I guess that's just my take. I vibe, I vibe. But in general, yeah, I think that's right. And if it's not in anything I've written so far, I think it's a totally good, correct uh, direction to nice. go with this kind of analysis. Um... The other insight that I found interesting that I think I first saw in Interpretability in the Wild is this idea of path patching, where rather than intervening on a node, you intervene on an edge between nodes. So like mm -hmm. a single neuron in layer two thinks a neuron in layer one was patched, while every other neuron in layer two sees the correct layer one. And this is purely node level patching, I think. One of the annoying things about all of these other kinds of patching is that, like, way more of a headache to do code-wise. I have this library, Transformer Lens, which is, like, fun, fabulous for doing node-level patching. It's, like, basically a primitive operation. You can, like, mm -hmm. maybe just about hack together path patching, but it's kind of a headache. And, like, anything fancier is just, like, oh, God. While Redwood has their Rust Circuits library, which is kind of a headache for doing basic things, but it makes doing stuff like causal scrubbing fabulous. Interesting. Yeah, the uh, working through your collab on the interpretability grokking paper, the hooking stuff, I was like, oh yeah, that's what I have to do all the time to do everything I want to do. I connected yes. with you a lot where you wrote the mo transform model and then just had all these hook things. And well, yeah, that's what also my GitHub looks like is just a bunch of special case models of like all the standard stuff, except there are hooks placed like everywhere. So I can go in and do these swaps during training and evaluation. I love it. Ah, in Transformer Lens, this is a native feature of all Transformers. Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It makes me want to just... Uh, use transformer lens to do the back end of what I'm already doing. And it's probably like you know, you're coming it, I'll, to the right I'll conclusions. A I'll give it a yeah, I'll you know, I'll give it a shot next time I need to do a new model and need to hook it into this. Yes, it's great. I have like an actual maintainer, Joseph Bloom. And mm -hmm. this means that A, I don't really need to actually maintain the library, but also B, it is actually maintained rather than having me as the like neglectful person who is technically in charge but ignores pull requests for several weeks. So mm -hmm, it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. Amazing. Amazing. All right. All right. Figure two, high-level models. I love it. Okay. Okay. So let's just look at this guy. This is all that really matters right now. So this task, just some set of entities or objects, just some fine uh, comes in. Four objects are the input. These are all represented as like randomized token, not randomized vectors. <laughs> and the first step is just say, are the first two equal? That's the first variable, V1. Then the second variable, V2, is saying, are the next two equal? Then the third variable, V3, is saying, are V1 and V2 equal? Gotcha. And am I correct in thinking that equality is not associative? Like the order of the brackets here really matters. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Cool. 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 Yeah. Right. 100%. This is not just saying W, X, Y, and Z are all the same. It's like maybe no. W and X are both true. Y and Z are both false. That works fine. Yes. That's A, A, B, B is a success and A, B, C, D is a success, but A, A, B, C is a failure. So sad. Word. <laughs> and this is a massive lookup table. But I guess, yeah. importantly, you can both kind of characterize it in terms of its, like, black box behavior, but this mm -hmm. is also a very strong statement about model internals. Yep, that's exactly right. The high-level model is really just making two statements. There are two obvious things to compose, the first two inputs and the second two inputs, and you should create separate variables for them to solve this task. And in some Checks ways, out. Checks out. it seems like it would be weird if a system solved this task in a perfectly general way and didn't represent hey, these hey, variables. Hey. Rule one, 
of mechanistic interpretability. Models are fucking cursed. You yep. do not get to say, oh, it would be really weird if the model solved this task like this. Always be prepared for nonsense. Yep, except in this case, no nonsense. We get perfect results in the first layer. Just We just find a perfect alignment. We find a rotation oh, okay, for the good. first layer that just like 100% of our interchange interventions work out. With just to finish my rant that I was so rudely interrupted on, uh, <laughs> it's sorry, like, you think models will be reasonable, and you look at how they do modular addition, and it's fucking Fourier transforms. And it's like, what? Anyway, back to you. But then you look at how they do hierarchical equality, and you're like, hell yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. That's how I do hierarchical equality, right? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. What am I looking at? Why do you all have right. three layers? So the model that is trained on this hierarchical quality task is a three-layer NLP. Oh, no. And we are just analyzing it at each layer. And these are also showing you for different... Oh, so the one hyperparameter left in our algorithm is the number of dimension at, dimensions in this space that you're aligning a high-level variable with. Mm -hmm. That is fixed. Mm -hmm. But we now have a way to make that not fixed and make it entirely learned and incentivized to be as small as possible, which is awesome. Wait, what? But as in you just try a bunch of values and pick the best one? So that's what we do in this paper. But currently, in our uh, we have a method now where it's a new, it's a real valued parameter that's learned. What? But it's oh, a it's number of dimensions. How could oh, that dude. possibly be a real valued parameter that gets? So learned? it's it's a loose. So first, it's like. It's because Noah, uh, it's because Noah Goodman's a cool genius man. So it's like you generalize. So in the end, a lot of the space you're learning in is is not even like technically aligned to a full dimension or not a full dimension, but you can still snap it to this sort of problem during like evaluation time. But yeah, essentially it's just a real valued parameter that allows you to scan using sigmoid functions like a high and low pass filter to sort of select a chunk of dimensions. I don't know. Well, I, you know, that's maybe for a later time, but it's super cool. All right, it's all right. Cool. Let's drop that there. Okay, okay. Okay. So I want to understand the setup here. So you're trying to train a model to do hierarchical equality. You've got four inputs. Mm -hmm. The four inputs are like zeros and ones. But the model is like a multi-led perceptron. It's got matrices. It's got hidden layers. It's got two hidden layers and a single output. There's like, and the hidden layers have like, in the first row, you've got like 16 neurons, values on each of them, matrix multiply, another 16 neurons, values, and you've got to map to a single output. There's also biases on each neuron, and the output, what, goes into a like, if bigger than zero, true, else false kind of vibe. That's exactly right. Yep. And so you're like, thing. well, neural network, you sure have two steps of nonlinearities. It sure would be weird if you did not use these two nonlinearities to be like W equals X, Y equals Z in layer one, and then combination in layer two. I guess it could do, I guess it seems like it only needs one hidden layer for this. Mm -hmm. Like the final output could also be the end, and it's kind of ambiguous where this should happen. I think that is completely correct. And when you act in the results we find is that that's essentially what it looks like it's doing. The next, the second and third layer, we just don't find the representations. Mm -hmm. But the first one we can do. Okay. So, so you're specifically looking for the X equals Y intermediate variable and the sorry, W equals X intermediate variable and the Y equals N intermediate variable. Can mm -hmm. you just scroll back to the diagrams so people can remind themselves? What we're looking at. Yeah. Why is your diagram below the table? Cool. So we've got four inputs, they're binary. We have two intermediate variables, also binary, and one output. We're now going to do a bunch of linear algebra. Wait, how do we even determine if something is oh, equal? So, wait, the inputs aren't binary in this case. So oh. at the high level, they're oh. just some set, discrete set of things. And at the low level, they're just randomized token representations. So they're like one hot, like not one hot, like ra what? randomly initialized, just randomly initialized vectors. And you're like checking literal equality of the randomly yeah, initialized yeah, 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 yeah. vectors. No, it's literal equality of random initialized vectors. Yeah. What? Oh. This is a ridiculous task, but sure. But yeah, it learns it perfectly. I don't know. And how many tokens? 
I mean, there's just four tokens, right? Oh, 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 oh you mean the space of tokens? Oh, uh, yep. infinite, basically. Just, uh, yeah. Wow. It's just you a just stream. Like randomly generate tokens. You randomly generate yep. inputs that are yep. sometimes equal, sometimes not equal. Mm -hmm. You just have like a uniform distribution over like whether W, X, Y, and Z are like different or the same. Yep. Yep. And we do all those sorts of distributions based off the high level values to make sure that we get balanced classes for evaluations. Yes. But yeah, essentially, yes. The model can do this? Yeah. What? It, it sure is quirky. You know, Gary Marcus might tell you the models can't do these things, but a psychological review paper I have with Mike Frank and Chris Fox and Alexandra Karstensen will tell you they can do these things. They can do all sorts of little cute equality tasks. These things sure are cool. How many dimensions are the inputs in? The inputs are in four dimensions, I think. But you can do it with all sorts of sizes, I guess. Like, yeah. Um, I was just trying to think through how a model would actually implement equality. And I guess the obvious thing is you, I don't know, have a neuron that checks, is uh, element one of the input bigger than element one of the other inputs? Another neuron that checks is it less than, because Relius yeah. is very good at that. In that and paper then, I just mentioned, I wrote down a full technical solution for this, and that's exactly I love how it. to do it. Yep, I love yep. it, and that's how you do it. And you can just stack the networks to do this higher low quality thing, essentially. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. You use the relus to do less than, greater than, and that together gives you this like absolute value type function, and then it's a yeah, solves the thing. Yeah, Sorry, but yeah, networks can do this. Wild. I feel like you need and one hidden layer, man, but whatever, whatever, let's roll with it. Not only can networks do this with like uh, that they do it and we can also learn. So, all right, right. So network trained, perfect performance input out behavior on this task. Then we train to alignment in the first layer. And we say in the 16 neurons in this first layer, I want to find eight corresponding to the left hand equality and eight corresponding to the right hand equality. And the result is we were able to find rotation for the first layer with the intervention size eight with 100% interchange intervention accuracy, meaning you could pick any two pairs of examples or any, actually any example and any other two examples, and then seed both of these examples for the high level variables to do resampling ablation and the correct, the expected result will happen. And so this and is just basically just, just a check. perfect result. Mm -hmm. K equals eight here. That means you're picking some clump of eight neurons. We're not doing anything distributed. Mm, no, no, that's like a clump of eight things in the distributed space, in the rotated space. Oh, okay. So you're like picking some direction that you constrain to use at most eight neurons. Do you let it choose mm, the eight no, neurons? No, no, no. We're picking eight directions. Oh, sure. Okay, cool. This makes sense now. All right, word up. And so there's 16 directions in the rotated space. Half the directions correspond to the left-hand equality. Half correspond to the right-hand oh. equality. Oh, that's super cute. 1.00. It's wild. So many directions. Then when we sort of are just doing some sort of brute force search or we snap this rotated ma rotation matrix to be basis aligned, we see a huge drop in the interchange mm. intervention accuracy, meaning that the nearest by sort of like local list representation of neurons is not doing the same role, or we can't find an equally good clump of neurons as we can clump of rotated dimensions. Gotcha. And can you just like mouse over the bits in this table that are like much bigger than 0.5? So it seems like there's layer one, so like basically everything, but it gets a bit better the more directions you give it. Layer yep. one for left, what is left equality relation? All right, so left equality relation is if we only do the training for the left-hand high-level variable and we don't mm -hmm. include right-hand variable. And something you can say here is actually we can't find as good of alignment. So the training is kind of finicky when you're doing this orthogonal matrix space, and it seems to be pretty sensitive to random initialization. The underlying model is identical. You yes. train the underlying model the same way, but you're training yeah. your direction extraction differently. Exactly. This entire table cool. is all a fixed, high, well, two fixed models, one with 16 hidden dimensions and one with 32. Great. Okay. And so the left equality is just like input one equals input two. Mm -hmm. Identity of us argument is like, can we extract input one? 
an identity subset of electric quality is like this one is wacky. Know. So uh, so well, this is I the care? no no yeah you should care and this is not I, I think we're still figuring out how to explain this result well but it seems incredibly crucial to me so I'm going to do my best right now. <laughs> I am not optimistic. Viewers, right. you can skip ahead. All right. Well, <laughs> but go for the, it, go for it. yeah, the idea is that I think I have this Boolean variable that's true or false that's encoding X equals Y. But then mm -hmm. someone who's adversarial comes up to me and says, I think you're lying to me. I don't think that's a Boolean variable representing X equals Y. I think that is actually a tuple containing X comma Y. And you just think it represents x equals y because every time you replace x comma y with like x two comma y two, the same sort of impacts happen. So there's a question of whether if we have a variable that is causally downstream of two variables and we align this causally downstream variable with a group of dimensions, there's a question, can we learn subgroupings of those dimensions such that each subgroup corresponds to the inputs to this variable. So okay. In the case let, let of me, left hand quality. So yeah. you're like, there is just this feature of equality of like W equals X. And we believe this feature corresponds to a single direction in space. Mm -hmm. It would be reasonable for us to say this is some direction in space. And if we have a single direction, it like surely can't also be W. That would be ridiculous. But if we have two directions, well, that's, that's very generous. That's a lot of directions. One of them could be W. And in fact, it could be the case that W, one is W, the other is X. And the claim, oh, when you intervene, you get the same thing back, is basically the same as saying that would be equivalent to what direction one being W, direction two being X. And in the table above, you kind of needed to have multiple directions before you got good results. And so someone could be like, Atticus, you're scamming me. This this is not real. That's exactly right. That's a really good summary from what I said. I thought I really botched my explanation, <laughs> but like, I think you really salvaged. What yeah, that's exactly for. what I was trying to say. And the really cool, interesting result is no, like you can't find the individual vector identities encoded in, in this space. And so this is sort of telling you like, yeah, this this is sort of genuine composition of two inputs. Like this representation, you actually can't figure out what the identity of the inputs are. You can only figure out what the identity of the current value is. Mm. And uh, similar results on the BERT network, except when we identify something where, that we think represents lexical entailment, like uh, a dog being an animal, it actually turns out this thing we've identified is two separate representations of lexical items. So it's just one represents one token and one represents the other token and you can just intervene on the both separately and so we weren't actually able to identify a, a sort of composed lexical element representation separate from the other two inputs all right shall we end part two here i think yeah i think this is where we should end part two i feel like this is a uh, yeah yeah all right so just summarizing what we've learned in part two we're trying to build this causal model we believe in our heart of hearts that causal models are the right way to understand what neural networks do. We don't know the right units of analysis, and so we're trying to learn the right directions by learning this orthogonal matrix. And the mark of having found the right units is we can intervene on them successfully and preserve performance. This is an automated metric that is differentiable, so we can just do gradient descent to this. And we have this toy task of hierarchical equality where we believe there are meaningful intermediate variables and we are trying to learn directions in space that get us good performance on these interchange interventions. And we find that one direction is actually pretty damn good. It's not perfect. If we have more directions, we get really good accuracy. It's a little bit sketchy because the more directions you have, the more weird stuff you can be smuggling in but it like kind of works. And there's a bunch of implementation details around how to optimize this well, what the right accuracy is, how to interpret these. And it's so, so easy in interpretability to trick yourself and to think you know what's going on when you don't. But ah, we think we've made progress. Anything else, Atticus? Uh, your lovely man, lovely summary. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, yeah, now we're going to head to part three, where we look into how this is actually useful. Now you've spent like two hours going through a bunch of random ass theory. 